Hello. When I was a small kid, five or six, I used to go to the drive-in with my hippie parents almost every night, double feature. And when it was age-restricted, I used to hide in the passenger area on the floor under my mum's caftan, and uh, my dad used to wave at the ticket seller. We watched movie after movie after movie. When the movies had a bad or sad ending, I'd rewind the film in my head and rewrite it from the point that it went wrong to make it have a better narrative, a happier ending. When I got home at night, I would not go to sleep until I had edited each frame of the movie to make it more lovable, more kind to the characters. And I'd go to school the next morning in a bit of a mess, but happy that I'd somehow changed somebody's biography and given uh, a character a different life. Years later, when I was about 17, 1984, 85, I went to the theater for the very first time. I was a good Pretoria girl, prefect at Pretoria Girls High School, living in a uh, white Pretoria suburb with an eccentric family at the height of apartheid um, during censorship. And I sat down in the market theater, and that, that night, my life, my biography, my narrative changed. I saw a play called Born in the RSA, and Tommy and Bongo is going to do a little extract from that play. Thank you, Tommy. We tiptoed down the passage and stopped at the door. She opened it. Dumisane was lying on his back in a big double bed. His face was solid. His eyes were closed. Everything around him was little blue flowers. The curtains, the pillows under his bed. He started to moan, and Mia quickly closed the door. I just wanted to pick him up and carry him home. I walked back towards the bus stop. I realized that I was still carrying his baseball bat and record. As I passed the convent school, I was still thinking of Dumisane. The playground was full of little white girls in their neat uniform, having their morning break. I watched them running, laughing, and playing. And I said, yeah, man. Every one of you has a name. She feeds you. She comforts you. She washes those uniforms. She even polishes those shoes. And every time she leaves Soweto and Alexander, leaving her own children and saying goodbye to her children, she doesn't know whether she will see them again alive or dead. Yeah, your nanny knows where your kitchen knives are. She even knows where your dirty hides the revolver. Your mother's nanny knew too. She even knows where your father's hides the revolver. Ask her about our children and the soldiers who shoot them dead. Ask her what she's waiting for, for us to prove that we can kill children as well. Suddenly, I moved through the gates to the middle of the playground. I started to swing the baseball bat. Skulls cracked, braids and baby teeth flew. I splintered arms and legs and spines. There was blood everywhere. I went on swinging left and right. I was a panther. I was a tiger. I was everything they wanted me to be. I was their black King Kong. A bell started to ring. I found myself on a pavement. The bell was calling the children to go inside. I continued to watch them play. I couldn't breathe. I turned and walked up Oxford Road. I heard myself yelling, fuck you. Fuck you for what you have done to Dumisan. Fuck you. Fuck you for what you are doing to me. Thank you, Tommy. You see, I was one of those little white girls in the playground, and I didn't have a nanny to shine my shoes, but I was one of those kids, safe, protected, as children should be, innocent, naive. But that night in the market theater, it was as if a curtain rose on my vision, and I could see. I knew who I was, where I came from, I knew about my country, and I was sitting in an auditorium in a community 
that had been enlightened, that was engaged, like TEDx is today, a community of people and a storyteller and listeners. And I decided right there and then that whatever they were doing on stage, I wanted to do. So at the time I was registered for law, I was gonna study law, I deregistered and I, and I registered for drama, thinking that I would have to become an actress to do that. Um, and after a little while, I soon realized that I was a very lousy actress. And um, luckily, I had this ability at times to tell stories. And so I started looking for uh, the perfect story. I directed, I made theater, and I started to write. It was a sort of ob obsession, um, like when I was a child, to to make things right, to put things right, to make the perfect story. And there was uh, an obsession that grew in me about light and dark, about contrasts and juxtapositions. Being in this country, how do we feel the light? How do we find healing? And one of the ways I realized was that one has to engage in the dark to experience the light. Um, and years and years later, uh, 2001, which was the first real proper play that I wrote called Tsipang, our country was um, devastated by a, a storm of darkness. And uh, the headlines were filled with um, headings saying, nine-month-old baby Tsipang raped by six men. And at the time, my daughter, uh, Rebecca, was also nine months old. And I felt as if my skin had been peeled off, as if... Uh, the devil had spat at me. I was, I was completely um, devastated by, by the idea of, of infant rape, and I decided to go on a journey, an investigation, to write a play that would somehow um, try to understand, try to engage in, try to find healing, um, and, and, and mostly endeavor to understand what was going on in our country. Um, and I drew from various characters that I knew, people in my life, and uh, stories and events. And one of the characters was um, an ambulance driver that I met by chance. Um, we were staying in Irene in Pretoria at the time, and our domestic worker, Wendy, had a flat in our garden. And she, um, her child, Quinny, was pregnant, and she was five months pregnant, and she started to miscarry. Um, she went into labor, and I went into inside to phone the ambulance and get some things together. A couple of minutes later, the ambulance arrived, and um, I looked through the window, and I saw a tall, white, thin, pimply guy get out of the ambulance. And just at that time, I had a, a flashback to, again, when I was a child, eight or nine years old, again on the way to the movies with my mum in the afternoon, and we... Um, we had an accident with a delivery man. Um, my mom crashed into him. And he was lying on the pavement, unconscious. And my mom was screaming and waiting and trying to get hold of an ambulance. And an ambulance arrived. And um, this, this ambulance wouldn't take the man to the hospital because it was a black man and it was a white ambulance. Um, and although my mom cursed and threatened, um, he wouldn't, this burly, burly Afrikaans bloke wouldn't take him to the hospital and we had to wait for a very long time before a black ambulance arrived. So with that in mind and that perception in mind, uh, I went back um, to the flat outside, ran past the ambulance, ready to have a fight uh, with the old South African in my head, ready to have a fight with the ambulance driver. And I walked into the room and this young ambulance driver had this little bundle at his feet, he was kneeling on the ground. And he was trying to resuscitate um, what was really a, a, a little, a little web-like creature, a beautiful little premature infant boy. Um, and the ambulance driver was desperate to, to resuscitate this child and he was uh, massaging his chest and clearing his throat and uh, putting oxygen on the little child. And minutes and minutes and minutes went by and the ambulance driver became more and more desperate. And eventually there was the silence, and it was very clear that um, the baby was dead. And the ambulance driver put his forehead on the baby's chest, 
and he began to cry, a huge, big wail of a cry. And I stood as audience, as witness, once again, in a different way, my perceptions being altered, being changed, um, quite wrong about this character. His grief was palpable. And uh, I used this story in, in my play of Baby Tsipang. Um, and later we made a, a short animated film um, uh, using this climatic scene. And uh, Gerard Marx and I made the movie together. And I have um, a little extract to show you of that scene. Thank you. There in the dust, an arm, some fingers, hands, a small little crumpled face, a tiny pot belly, fat little thighs, and in between her thighs, lay a mess like a cauliflower, red, bloody, a tiny, tiny little vagina, split open. She had been raped, sodomized, disemboweled, they said. She was nine months old. Everybody stood dead still. Finally, Old Anna, trembling like a chicken, took her shawl and covered the baby. He stood in the hot sun, Makulu glaring at us for over an hour. None of us could move. We were like Lot's wife. We had been turned into salt. Then finally, an ambulance arrived like a great white shark on desert sand. Out he jumped a very tall white man, blonde hair, blue eyes, and quite a few pimples. Afterwards, old Anna said he looked like Goliath from the Bible. None of us said a word. You like it? We stood, bags of salt. said a word, no one moved. It was like we were in church. We stood at our altar. <laughs> then he carefully picked up the baby and he walked towards the ambulance. He opened the back doors and he climbed in. He put the baby on a metal bed. But before the doors were shut, through the gap, I saw the big man, Goliath, kneel down next to the baby. He put his forehead on her forehead. And then he began to cry. A great big heave of sob, like an earthquake, he cried. Um, and uh, we, did, we did the play, and at first, um, only two or three people came to the play. And it was a complete disaster. Nobody, nobody wanted to engage in this subject matter. And... Um, after a while, uh, um, the audiences grew um, until such a time as we, we actually ran the play for 10 years on and off, and we still occasionally do a presentation. Um, and, and the reason this happened is because the audience started to feel safe in the environment of the theater. They, they started to feel part of a community that was engaging in the dark 
and therefore allowed to experience the light through communication. Um, and that's, that's really the power of theatre. Because theatre brings together people of all um, classes and races and cultures and ages and sexes and, and allows people to see each other in, in the glorious light of humanity. And it's the only place that really does that. Um, and so this, me trying to write and trying to create stories and trying to, to, to engage is, is just simply my attempt to find a healing in our country and, a, and some kind of a future and a narrative for our kids. Um, and the power of theatre is that we can change our narratives and change our biographies. Thank you. <laughs>